so for you Joyce did did you once you found out that you're an INFJ did you um how we how have your family have they kind of understood that has it helped or is it not something that is understood very well by them yet with my family they don't really know about type okay. so they I haven't had a chance to kind of explain it to them I, yeah. with my brother he's an ESTP a few years ago he went up to me and he told me sorry for how he's treated me oh. and even if people don't know about type it'll come back to them so they'll have the realizations without even knowing the system and so yeah. he was telling me about how he always assumed that I, I wasn't someone who would be successful because of how quiet I was it's almost like my reservedness was a an impediment or something not to be respected and I could feel it off of him in the comments he would make about me. He was trying to turn me into an extrovert, for lack of a better word. Mm. And he came up to me and he told me sorry for treating me like I would become a hobo because I wasn't like him. And then he realized that it was wrong. And so people come to realizations about type even without knowing the system because it's so pervasive in reality that people are going to come in contact with it. And that was very cathartic because that was a point of character development for him to be able to realize that things different than him have gifts. And he was proud of me. And that was something very refreshing in an Asian family. I see type as very important because it is a framework that allows us to not compromise other people's happiness or ability to feel meaning in their lives. Yeah. And I'll explain. If you know that someone else is different than you, you don't impose or project your own way of living as the ultimate way of living. And so with Asian parents, this is not imposing onto your extremely artistic child who has a, a talent with creative thinking into a very regimented feel that does the same thing over and over again, like accounting, or maybe they'll do well in accounting and that's great, but it ha you have to make sure that there's a good person to job fit sometimes. And that's a, a principle you can apply to life. And if you have someone who isn't meant to do something, but the only way you can respect them is if they do the thing that you need them to do, you're breaking them. It's like taking a tree and you're breaking the tree from the stump. And now you're, you're left with this broken what's left of the tree and you wonder why it's not growing fruit and the reason why it's not growing fruit is because you didn't let the tree grow fruit and type is one of the ways we can make sure we don't stifle the gifts of other people it helps us respect other people's true gravity so you notice what they're drawn to and what they're meant to do in the world and you're not cutting them off of that prematurely because as human beings, we're susceptible to peer pressure. And sometimes that peer pressure can take us away from ourselves. And that's why a lot of people go to therapy. They realize how far they've gone from their true self or their true nature. And the process of therapy is actually unlearning everything that's not them so that they can return back to themselves. And type helps us acknowledge that process sooner. It helps us save time. That's, that's absolutely so true. Um, I know in uh, my practice, uh, I worked with a lot of intuitive types in my practice. And it was because of that, that I ended up taking the test myself. And I, I, I just couldn't understand why I was having so much fun in my practice. And I realized it was because all the, well, I say all of it, most of the people who were coming to the practice were weird like me and I was having really good conversations with them and it was fun and they were really you know coming on and it it was like therapy for me too because I was you know um I was helping people who I discovered later on had intuitive preferences to develop a positive sense of self and their place in the world and so on and also to separate the um to separate out what was trauma in their childhood from what was 
to do with being different because there was there was sort of um it was in it was tangled up you know it was kind of tangled up with this limiting belief systems where um some of it was around trauma because some of them had had very very traumatic um, backgrounds and, and some of it was then you know having trauma at home and then going to school and being the weird kid you know so it was kind of you know they were getting it um and, and it was separating those things out and then um also getting into so how do you use these gifts well how do you use these these are actually gifts or this is a you know these are skills however you want to frame it um, how do you use them well you know um, instead of um, any for example extrovert intuition you know generating anxiety how about it generating creative ideas because if it's if it's not kind of um, being used one way it will it will kind of divert to the other way uh, because it's a function and it's a busy th function and it wants to be used kind of thing so it was uh yeah it's an interesting thing and, and, and in interesting and so important to to find your tribe isn't it just you know um and uh and then because i don't know about yourself joyce but i find myself um working really really well creatively with other intuitive types so um finding my tribe for me wasn't just a case of feeling accepted and normal if you like but it was also a case of okay with you i can do some really good work with you i can do something really you know um great and i'm not being kind of, I'm not being racist against sensing type series. I'm not doing the backhanded, you know, because also, of course, at the same time as realizing what you're good at, you also realize what you're not good at and what, you know, and really value and appreciate that in other people as well. So it's really so well put. Mm. That is really, really well put, Maria. And so I find that with people, sometimes what's not understood is we're, what we were talking about earlier is how we tend to look down on people who are not like us subconsciously because there's a primal part of our brain that can jump to the conclusion if they're not using this part of their brain they're not using their brain at all but what's happening in reality is actually because they're not using that part of their brain as much it, their brain energy is al actually allocated to a different area of their brain and so their talents lie in a different part where they're allocating most of their function in and so what this teaches us is that people just use different gifts differently it's the cost of specialization if you're specializing in one area it, it makes the other area a little harder to specialize into because we have a limited amount of time in our time on earth it's akin to your left hand and your right hand and so if you use your right hand all the time and it's your dominant hand you're going to have a little bit more proficiency with it than your left hand unless you're ambidextrous that's a little bit of a different case but for most people preferences are a real thing whether or not we like it and just because someone can't use their dominant right hand like you doesn't mean they don't have a dominant left hand they just have their strengths allocated in a different area and this takes us back to what you were saying earlier because we get to kind of appreciate people who operate differently than us and that's the purpose of type uh, and it also helps us find our weirdos so that we have representation and modeling someone we can model after and that's empowering a lot of human beings look for the feeling of elevation and that means finding someone you can kind of view as your hero not in a weird pedestal -y way that might be unhealthy to an extent extent but studies show that when people have superheroes like Iron Man or Captain America to look up to, it actually does something for your brain, where if there's a heroic figure in your mind, you're more likely to do heroic things. Mm -hmm. And people search for a feeling of elevation because there's a core need for us to serve. That is the most purposeful 
cool thing people can do on earth, serve in their own way. And so when we find someone of our type, they help model and become a sort of representation where we can believe in ourselves a bit more and bring out the hero in us so we can experience that feeling of elevation, which empowers us to help other people and to help ourselves. Because when I look in across my life and I look at myself, when I haven't been feeling empowered, it actually creates a sort of lack of self-care. I start to become self-negligent yeah. and the self-neglect yeah. spreads over to many areas of my life. It can look like laziness when it really comes out of a place of a lack of a self-acceptance yeah. because I don't have yeah. those role models or that representation to make me feel like good things are possible. Yeah. Sometimes we need a model that good things are possible to believe and to try for them. It's almost like for world records, people couldn't break it because for a certain amount of time, because they thought it was impossible. They're like, people can only run this fast or jump this high. But once there was one person to break that world record, many other people felt the ability to break that world record as well. Yeah, absolutely. And definitely. And I think, um, yeah, I think, um, and, and it can be difficult, like you say, to find them. I mean, um, online is good now. Being able to find people online is a good thing, isn't it? Um, people that you, you look up to and aspire to. Um, yeah, I think I think you you make such a good point there. I mean, I think there's probably, especially with a, a minority group again, like intuitives, wishing they could go to Hogwarts. You know, where's Hogwarts? Why can't they go to, <laughs> with their kids? And then and then as as adults looking for mentorship, and and it is a healthy thing to do, isn't it? It's a healthy thing. You always need to um, to have something to aspire to. It's sort of, you know, um, yeah. So uh, something that I noticed in my practice and we touched on briefly um, when you did my type um, clarification. So I'm just going to say that I, um, I met Joyce through watching her YouTube channel and um, really enjoying the videos, brilliant videos, and thinking that, I would, I'd like to have a type clarification um, session with Joyce because I had been um, typed twice, three times actually, I think, um, as INTJ um, through the official typing system. And I also knew about the functions, type functions, because I'd, I'd read up on type functions and all the rest of it. And yet I, I by long way did not fit the stereotype INTJ. And I knew that stereotypes were just that, stereotypes. But the fact that my functions um, didn't seem to come out and they didn't come out in function tests either as a typical INTJ because my FI was so developed. Uh, one of my functions, which is a feeling function was so well developed and it was much better more developed than my extroverted thinking function. So, and a lot of people would tell me, um, well, you're not an INTJ because you're too warm and you know, you're too friendly. And, and how about the fact that you like people so much? And how about the fact that you, you seem like a feeler and blah, blah, blah. And um, so I thought I'd have a type clarification session and I did this with, well, Joyce um, provided this for me and she did a brilliant job, really good. And it was very, very interesting. Um, but what, what we touched on in that session was the fact that um, I had developed differently to the kind of average INTJ. And, um, and I believe that that was to do with my background um, um, coming from a traumatic childhood background and that I developed that way because I needed to. And also it was, um, it was a safe way for me to develop. Um, so, um, so what I wanted to ask you, just to expand on that a little bit, I wanted to talk a bit about that with you. Um, cause you did say to me afterwards that, um, you'd met other INTJs who also had got that more developed feeling function. 
Um, and, and I wondered how many people you've come across who have this unusual developed function system and whether it was it was it's all a traumatic kind of thing do you know what I mean whether it's it's because um somebody just wasn't in the environment where they could have developed as they probably naturally would have done is that something you've come across a lot and it's been down to trauma yes so there are many factors that can make someone develop their tertiary function more one of them is trauma Another one is gender or sexual orientation. And so women are more likely to develop their feeling functions due to cultural upbringing. And men are more likely to develop their thinking function due to cultural upbringing. There's also a myriad of other factors like the culture of the area you grew up in. If you go to Japan, it's gonna seem like everyone in Japan is an introvert because they act like it but it's not necessarily true. It's augmentation due to environment. So nurture can really affect how we show up, whether it's trauma or another thing as well. And I find people who develop their tertiary function to be very fascinating because I'm one of them too. Okay. I, my introverted thinking is really developed for an INFJ and it allows me to scrutinize logic way better than a typical INFJ would be. And that's because our third function is also known as a relief function. And so we go to it in times of wanting to relieve ourselves or when we're feeling defensive or when we're feeling unsettled inside it, our automatic is to jump to our third function. And so when you're in an environment which encourages you to need relief, often you're going to use your third function a lot to the point of almost feeling like a different version of your type because you've created a new subtype due to trauma. It's almost like how certain mental disorders will actually impact the chemistry of your brain. If you scan people's brains, a person's brain looks different depending on what types of trauma and what types of situations they've been in. And that goes through your personality type as well. And that's why you see so much variation within INTJ, but they're still an INTJ, they're just a less stereotypical version because they weren't born in the stereotypical circumstance and not as the stereotypical gender of the type. And so that really impacts it as well. That's really interesting because, um, because I found your videos different. So your, your uh, MBTI uh, videos, um, are very appealing to me and and part of that is I guess it's probably the logical um aspects to them you know that sort of um appeals to me yeah uh yeah it, it is it's interesting isn't it to see kind of uh, so so is that considered would that would you be considered a jumper is that the right term or is that a different thing altogether yeah they would be called jumpers and so these people would be like, so 50% of people are jumpers and 50% are the normal variation. Oh, okay. So it's quite common to actually be a jumper as well. Right. Okay. So it's not, oh, that's okay. I didn't know that. That That's really interesting. And you can sort of, um, you can sort of, I feel like you could kind of sense that in people. I suppose, I suppose you, you know, you pick up on things. I did wonder actually whether Michael was a jumper on your Michael INTJ, who you have sometimes on your channel. Is it? He identifies as that. He's a very FI heavy INTJ. Right. He feels like that to me. That's the feeling I get from him. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, because I sort of notice as well with FI heavy INTJs, um, I find them really funny. I think we all think we're funny, don't we? We all think our jokes are funny, whatever, and if people are a bit like us. And then, you know, I find then to have a, a good sense of humor, that's something that I've noticed with with people who, who seem to have more of that feeling function developed um, in that way. So... So with the, so with yourself, have you, um, so do you focus on your FE more 
do you focus on on developing more or do you just you know kind of be as you are kind of thing if you know what i mean yeah with my fe it's a tool function so typically your auxiliary function you use it as a tool but it's really easy to put it back into the toolbox and to not always feel a need to engage in it mm -hmm. is interesting because i grew up in a chinese context and it's very fe devoid of it uh, so growing up i didn't really have to use my fe and it was discouraged i would say please and thank you i like taught myself how to say please and thank you to people because i wanted to be polite and i wanted people to feel acknowledged and valued uh, and i used to get reprimanded for the way that i did it so i just did i stopped doing it over time um, it's quite interesting. I think type is a very useful thing to have in your life mm -hmm. because without it, we mistreat people by accident. And it's just because we treat them the way that we think we want to be treated. So there's the golden rule and there's the platinum rule. The golden rule is treat people the way you want to be treated. And the platinum rule is to treat people the way they want to be treated. And so type teaches us to treat people the way they would want to be treated. So for instance, with certain INTJs, not all of them, they might want very straightforward feedback. It's like, if I didn't do something well, come up to me one-on-one -on -one and you can actually tell me what I didn't do right. But maybe for an FJ, they might go like sugarcoat it a little bit because it, I am sensitive as a human being. <laughs> and yeah. so it allows us to be mindful of how certain people would like to take certain things. Yeah. Now, if people are jumpers and stuff, that makes it complicated, but I'm just saying it as a blanket generalization for now. And so oftentimes, like, I'll give you an example um, with my dad. He's an ISTJ and oftentimes he doesn't take jobs seriously unless they're an official job. So, oh, you're having an organization and you work a nine to five for a company that people really know about. Uh, otherwise, he doesn't see it as a real thing. Um, and so when I record videos while he's still at home, he's playing his music in the background and he's talking at full volume because he doesn't respect my type of what job the, because he doesn't yeah. see it as a real job. And so I just get super NITI in a loop because I'm like, all right, I really don't feel like FEing this person because they're not FEing me. Yeah. It's that petty child mentality where it's like, well, if you're not even going to reciprocate it, then I'm not going to reciprocate it. And so you, you develop into an INFJ that loops more. Yeah. And that's where my journey with looping started. <laughs> right. OK. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's almost like um, the two things. If you're not being respected because someone doesn't get you so you're not being respected in your environment um then yeah you would naturally you would naturally do the looping and then maybe get good at the looping and then you're a jumper so you're good at it but you still need to come out of it the same way that somebody who wasn't um a jumper would come out of it so you're still going to be using your fe to get out of the loop even though you've got a really good handle on using your NI with your TI. Um, yeah, you still, I, I relate to that, to having to get out with TE, to having to logic my way out of the loop kind of thing. Yeah, I can relate to that. Um, yeah, interesting. Okay, so one thing, a question that I'm, I wanted to ask you, this is sort of, um, this is just, this is pretty self-indulgent of me, to be honest, but I'm going to ask it. And it's just, I'm really interested in the psychic side of NI, of introverted intuition. You know, it really fascinates me. And, um, and, and, and any kind of psychic experiences or whatever, I'm really interested in that sort of thing. And I wondered how, I wondered if it was different when it's filtered through, uh, you, you know, NIFE, you know, for an INFJ, whether it was different for an INFJ to an INTJ, um, and whether you have experienced um, many INTJs 
um, sharing psychic experiences they might have had with you, whether that whether there's more INFJs that have shared or, you know, I'm just wondered about that. Absolutely. The way that my psychicness shows up is when I was a little kid, the first moment I could think cognitive thoughts in my head, I thought, wow, my family is such a mess. And that's because I have this ability to predict outcomes. So I know if this dynamic between two people keep continuing on, you're going to hate each other in 20 years. I'm like, if you guys already fight like this at a good period of your relationship, later on, problems just get worse. And as a kid, I was really good at seeing where things were leading, how things were unfolding. And that was a part of my psychicness. Um, another part of it too was spotting gifts and talents in people. So I kind of can see where a person feels the most happy and I can see where they would be the most fulfilled doing certain things. So I'll encourage people to do certain things. I'll, I'll see that they're the happiest when they do this and actually it comes way more naturally to, to them to do this and what they create is actually beautiful. I'm likely to encourage talents. So I can see the Mozart or Picasso or the hidden talent in people. And I want to support and encourage that so they feel permission to be more of that side of themselves. Um, another way it can show up is vibrations, the vibes I get off of people. Some people just feel slimy like snake oil. You don't really have reasons yet, but you just know that they feel dark or negative and that they'll bring havoc their way. Yeah. That's one of the ways too. That's, that's really interesting. And it's interesting how, um, it's interesting to me, like how you frame, frame it as well. Um, I think um, it's very similar for me, but framed differently. So um, in terms of seeing talents and things like that, um, I would say that I can see people's abilities and I want to help to get them to that level, you know, and I'll think of way, systems to do that. So systematic kind of how could, you know, what system could facilitate this for this person? What kind of, so it's quite, you know, practical, you know, um, and also seeing how things pan out, but then again, Probably for me, it's more um, big picture and sort of standing back and um, looking at um, structures and looking at it in a structural, systematic point of way, point, uh, um, but with people, with like power structures. I'm, I, I think on one of your videos, they were talking a little bit about power structures, the INTJs. To me, it's really obvious. Power structures are really obvious. And if, if power is being abused... Yeah. You know, if it's being abused, how it's being abused, um, how to fix it, all that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I, I look at that a lot. So absolutely, so, it's very. Go on, sorry, go on. It's very INTJ of you to be able to find the systems and structures to transform a person's life. I like to transform people's lives by directly impacting their mood and their feelings. Whereas you go the route of transforming the systems around them. Yeah, so. yes, that's that's it, yeah. And actually it, it, it's, it's even kind of like, um, I look at their thinking patterns. So it's, it's about their, to me, it's about their, how their thinking patterns, their belief structures, um, how, um what is coming from you know what's the underlying belief that's resulting in this continuous pattern this looping pattern or whatever it is that they're doing so it's like always what's underneath what's underneath what's underneath because getting to what's underneath is the key to um releasing somebody from that pattern it's kind of like a a little key that you can kind of hand to them or they find with 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 your help and they're like oh okay I've got it I've got it I can see why I'm doing this now so now I can get out of it yeah it's, it's just it is interesting so you're kind of using um you're, you're using emotional keys I guess 
to kind yeah, of- Yeah, because I find that to be the biggest impact point. It's a, a bias. So NFJs find the impact point to sometimes be transforming emotions and moods and people's feelings directly. Whereas for the NTJs, the big impact point is going to be the TE, transforming the systems around them, the core action step that needs to be enacted so you can get a standard operating procedure to work so that people's, the systems and people's lives change. And, and also, yeah, and the systems inside people's head. So that's, it's sort of like subconscious, what is happening in the subconscious and, you know, all to do with like where, where something hails from. So it, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, the, but bring, if you bring the two things together, what a powerful change, you know, facility for facilitation for change that, that is bring, bringing those two kind of, kind of things together. So Okay, well, thank you so much, Joyce. It's been every bit as fascinating and enlightening as I thought it would be talking to you. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, Joyce um, does uh, assessments. She does MBTI assessments for people, personality um, assessments, and also clarification sessions like she did for me. So if anybody out there has had their Myers-Briggs type done, but is a little bit unsure still, Joyce is your woman. Um, and just for learning more about it, um, learning about your personality and finding all the good things about yourself um, and how best to use those and bring those to the world. And Joyce, you can be contacted, just say again where you can be contacted. Yeah, my email address is joycemang22 at gmail.com. And you can find all my contact information on my YouTube channel where I'll have it in the description below. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria, for having me on. You're a really good speaker and it was really captivating and you provide an inspiration to the INTJs around you. Oh, thanks, Joyce. Really appreciate that. Thank you.